We are back. Journey to 600. We're back talking about shoulder pathology part two. So this is just the title slide that we used last time talking about part one and part two. Part one, we covered muscle power deficit and radiating pain. Part two, we're going to cover mobility deficit and movement coordination impairment. It is based on the score builder's book and gold is highly seen on board. So that adhesive capsulitis, shoulder OA, total shoulder, arthroplasty are highly tested on boards. Shoulder dislocation is seen a little bit less, but still important. Labral tear, something we should discuss, but not necessarily one of the top three things that score builder sees on boards. So what is mobility deficit? It is when you have a range of motion limitation, which can lead to weakness and joint hypomobilities. So things that fall under mobility deficit is adhesive capsulitis and shoulder OA. Adhesive capsulitis is inflammation, synovitis, and stiffness of the glenohumeral joint capsule, contributing to development of adhesions, fibrosis, and the capsule ligamentous complex. This is also known as frozen shoulder. Mechanism of injury can be idiopathic in nature, or it could be due to trauma. Some factors associated with adhesive capsulitis are female, greater than 40, trauma, diabetes, thyroid disease, prolonged immobilization, stroke or heart attack, or history of adhesive capsulitis in the other arm. So adhesive capsulitis goes through these phases where it's really painful, then it freezes, then it's frozen, and then it thaws. And this process can be very, very long. In that first stage, they have pain in range with achy pain at rest and begin to lose that external rotation range of motion. So the capsular pattern for a shoulder is loss of range of motion greater for external rotation than abduction than internal rotation. So being mindful of what range of motion is limited and to what percent it's limited. Along with pain and loss of range of motion, they will have hypomobile joint play and weakness of the shoulder. Once it gets to the part where it's freezing, they will continue to lose range of motion in all directions, not just external rotation. And then when it's frozen, that is where they have significant pain and loss of range of motion. And then that thawing process is where we're coming in, we're helping improve that range of motion and decreasing their pain. Intervention is typically through NSAIDs and cortisone injections. If it does not improve, they could benefit from manipulation under anesthesia or a capsular release. Shoulder osteoarthritis. Mechanism of injury is a degenerative process of articular cartilage. This is typically seen in patients older than 55, and women are more at risk to develop OA. Risk factors that contribute to shoulder OA is overweight, fractures or other joint injuries, occupational or athletic overuse. The presentation is a deep, aching shoulder pain. They may report popping and catching, and they also have a progressive loss of range of motion. Medical intervention will be an x-ray to determine severity. If needed, they will get a total shoulder arthroplasty or a shoulder replacement. Total shoulder arthroplasty, so typically, like I said, the indication would be shoulder OA or some type of fracture or rotator cuff dysfunction needing that replacement. After surgery, their rehab precautions are limited flexion and external rotation more than internal rotation, limit extension or horizontal abduction past neutral, no reaching behind their back, no resisted internal or external rotation, especially if the inspiratus is repaired, avoid weight bearing through the upper extremity, avoid lifting or overhead activities, no carrying anything heavier than a cup for six weeks. Typically, they'll be braced and slight flexion and abduction. Movement coordination impairment. So movement coordination impairment is impairments with either the passive or dynamic stabilizers. Passive structures include things like the ligaments, joint capsule, and labrum. Dynamic structures are like the muscles and neuromuscular control. So impairments with passive structures lead to hypermobility. Impairments with dynamic structures are weakness, weakness with those muscles. So shoulder dislocation 
Anterior shoulder dislocations are the most common at 95%. And with shoulder dislocations, there can be subsequent injuries such as a bank heart fracture and heel sac lesion. And that is when the humeral head anteriorly dislocates, the anterior part of the glenoid rim breaks off, which is the bank heart lesion, and the humeral head hits the glenoid rim, making a lesion, which is the hill sacs lesion. So mechanism of injury for an anterior dislocation is force external rotation and abduction with a posterior force, or traction to the arm in an anterior direction, or trauma to the shoulder with force in a posterior to anterior direction. Posterior dislocation would be a fall on an outstretched arm with the arm flexed, adduction, and internally rotating, putting it at risk for that posterior dislocation. Trauma to shoulder with force in an anterior to posterior direction. Inferior dislocation would be typically due to forceful shoulder hyper abduction. The presentation of shoulder dislocation or shoulder instability. So they would have reports of feeling shoulder instability, weakness of the shoulder muscles, hypermobile joint mobility. Special tests would be a positive apprehension, which can, which can be done when you bias anterior and posterior directions. Positive sulcus sign, which is for an inferior instability. Medical intervention for dislocation would be to reduce the shoulder and imaging to assess for other injuries, or once it is back in, they could potentially do a thermal capsular raffi, which tightens the capsule to prevent another dislocation. A labral tear. The mechanism of injury is a fall on an outstretched arm, repetitive overhead activities, dislocation, and degenerative process. The presentation is a deep aching pain in the shoulder with diffuse upper trap pain, Reports of clicking, catching, popping with shoulder movements, hypermobile joint mobility, weakness of shoulder muscles, and special tests include active compression, also known as O'Brien's, biceps load, and crank tests. Medical intervention for a labral tear is a biceps tenodesis where they reattach the biceps because the biceps can be involved with a labral tear or a slap repair. There are different types of labral tears. Type one lesion, is, a de is due to a degenerative process common in ages 40 and older, marked by fraying of the superior labrum. So they will have fraying, but biceps will be still intact. Type two lesion, fraying of the superior labrum with a detached biceps anchor, which is type two is the majority of lesions and it's common in overhead athletes due to the pillback mechanism, which occurs during the maximal caulking phase of the throwing motion. So type two is really important to remember. Type three and four are not fraying tears, but more of a bucket handle tear. So type three is a bucket handle tear of the superior labrum with a normal biceps tendon attachment. So no biceps involvement, but type four is a bucket handle tear with a tear of the biceps tendon. All right, that is all for part two of the shoulder pathologies. Practice question number one. A 45-year-old female patient reports shoulder pain as well as limited range of motion that is impairing her function. She reports that it has progressively gotten worse. You suspect adhesive capsulitis according to the capsular pattern of the shoulder, which of the following range of motion would be most limited? A, flexion. B, internal rotation, C, external rotation, or D, abduction. I'll give you a moment to answer. Please pause if you're not ready to review. This question is not asking you for a diagnosis. It is saying that you suspect adhesive capsulitis, which you have to know this is a capsular pattern. And it's really just asking you a definition question of what is the capsular pattern of the shoulder. So what range of motion is most limited when you have a capsular pattern? And that is C, external rotation. So the capsular pattern for the shoulder is 
The most range of motion is lost with external rotation, then abduction, then internal rotation. Going back to a little differential diagnosis chart, this is kind of where I started, but you can feel free to add on. But just looking what is the diagnosis, where is their area of pain, are there any signs that are very characteristic of that diagnosis, and does it have any special tests? So adhesive capsulitis, it starts with that pain in range, then it just is pain all around, and that range of motion loss is in that capsular pattern. It does not have special tests. Shoulder OA has more of a deep, aching pain with progressive loss of range of motion. Shoulder instability, they're going to report that shoulder instability and you're going to see a lot of hypermobility in the shoulder. Special tests are apprehension and sulcus sign. Labral tear, again deep and aching pain, so that's very similar to shoulder OA, but they're going to have more reports of clicking and catching with special tests that include O'Brien's, biceps load, and crank. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications. See you next time on your journey to 600.